Hello, my name is Amanda Siegel and I'm a fourth year pharmacy student currently on rotation in the emergency department at Freighard Hospital. Today I will be discussing initial resuscitation strategies in sepsis and septic shock that are particularly important for pharmacists to know in the emergency department setting. Here are a few objectives I'd like you to achieve while watching this video. First, I'd like you to understand the pathophysiology behind sepsis and then identify common pathogens and infection sites. In addition, I'd like you to understand how to utilize the SEERS criteria, SOFA score, and QSOFA. Lastly, I'd like you to describe the treatments for initial resuscitation in septic patients. Sepsis is a much more common condition than most healthcare providers realize. In 2013, it was estimated that sepsis affects about 300 in every 100,000 people in the U.S. This is a relatively high prevalence with millions of people affected each year. In addition, it has a high mortality rate and about one in every four people with sepsis die. This number is closer to 50% mortality for the more severe septic shock cases. Sepsis alone is the most common cause of death in patients with infection. Due to the severity of the illness and requirement for hospital stays, um, sometimes in the ICU, it is very costly. In 2011 alone, sepsis accounted for roughly $20 billion in healthcare costs in the U.S. There are several different risk factors for developing sepsis. They include age, either a neonatal infant or an elderly person, um, the male gender, comorbid diseases, immunocompromise, alcoholism, chronic organ failure, um, the non-white ethnicities, cancer, and genetic polymorphisms. Although these risk factors do exist, it is important to recognize that any patient can develop sepsis, um, and it's crucial to assess all patients presenting in the ED with symptoms for sepsis and treat if needed. Here are the definitions of sepsis and septic shock directly from the 2016 Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines. The guidelines define sepsis as a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection. When diagnosing a patient with sepsis, the patient must have a suspected or documented infection, as well as an acute SOFA score change of greater than or equal to two points. SOFA stands for Sequential Organ Failure Assessment, um, and we'll talk more about the score and what it exactly assesses in patients in upcoming slides. Septic shock, on the other hand, is defined as a subset of sepsis with circulating and cellular or a metabolic dysfunction associated with a higher risk of mortality. Patients with septic shock display the signs and symptoms of sepsis, as well as require vasopressors to maintain a mean arterial pressure greater than or equal to 65 and a serum lactate of greater than 2 following fluid resuscitation. These definitions were recently updated from their 2001 definitions and are called sepsis 3. Previously, there were three categories of sepsis. They included sepsis, severe sepsis, and septic shock. Um, healthcare providers are shying away from using severe sepsis now because there is no gradient of life-threatening organ dysfunction. As long as you have organ dysfunction, you have sepsis. Thus, the guidelines and providers are only using sepsis and septic shock when diagnosing patients. Now we will go into the pathophysiology of the disease and how it occurs. Taking a look at the pathophysiology of sepsis, it is an exaggerated response to infection that affects the entire body. This occurs because you have a change in the amount of pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory mediators in the body. Usually, there is a balance between the two types of mediators. However, in sepsis, there is an increase in the cellular release of pro-inflammatory mediators, which causes changes in the endothelial tissue, coagulation, and blood flow. We'll talk more about the exact process on the next slide. In the pathophysiology of sepsis, there is a presence of an infectious pathogen that acts as an inflammatory stimulus. Once the inflammation process of the body is activated, pro-inflammatory mediators are released. These mediators include cytokines like PNF, alpha, IL-1, and IL-2. The cytokines cause damage to the endothelial tissue and eventually lead to an increase in coagulation factors. 
Because of the increase in coagulation and damage to the inner lining of the vessels, microthrombi can form in the vessels, which are very small blood clots. In addition, the clotting process activates platelets. The entire clotting process that's going on here um, is called disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, or DIC, and it takes time to develop. Thus, you will not typically see it occurring in patients in the emergency department unless they are presenting a long time after their symptoms began. The initial increase in coagulation factors that we talked about can cause difficulty for blood to flow through the vessels, and in order to get around the clots, vascular leakage begins to occur. In addition, vasodilation starts, which leads to third spacing of intravascular fluid. This means that fluid from the intravascular space, or the blood vessels, moves to the interstitial space between cells, causing edema and hypovolemia, um, or decreased blood volume. As a result, cardiac output and blood pressure decrease, and eventually there's a decreased perfusion to vital organs and end organ function. Because of the decreased blood supply to organs, sepsis is otherwise known as a type of distributive shock. The table here lists common pathogens that cause infection leading to sepsis. Gram-positive bacteria are the most common cause of the infections, resulting in roughly 50% of cases. Common gram-positives include Staph aureus, MRSA, Strep pneumo, and Enterococcus. Gram-negative bacteria are the second most common cause of infection in sepsis, resulting in about 35% of the cases. These bacteria include E. coli, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, and Enterobacter. The remaining pathogens do not account for high percentages of the sepsis cases, but include anaerobes, fungi, polymicrobial infections, and other organisms. It is important to recognize that this is not an all-inclusive list of pathogens. The site of infection and the usual organisms found at that site are the main determinants of the type of pathogens causing the possible sepsis. This table from a 2014 study on the epidemiology of severe sepsis displays the various sites of infection that may lead to the development of sepsis in an individual. These sites include respiratory, bacteremia, genitourinary, abdominal, wound slash soft tissue, um, and several others. Based on this data, the most frequent site of infection is a respiratory tract followed by bacteremia. However, when looking at the percent of mortality, the highest mortality rate occurs with bacteremia followed by endocarditis. Now we'll go over several different ways you can identify the signs of sepsis in patients you're treating. There are currently three different criteria used for septic patients. These include Sears criteria, the SOFA score, and QSOFA. The Sears criteria, or Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome, was first developed during a 1991 consensus conference on sepsis. At that point in time, physicians believed that sepsis was only caused by an inflammatory response. Researchers today now believe that it involves both a pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory response. The Sears criteria involve symptoms that many hospitalized patients without sepsis have, and they do not really signify a life-threatening response. Because of this, the Sears criteria have a low specificity for sepsis and are not the best to use when evaluating possible sepsis in your patients. However, healthcare workers still utilize them, so it is important to understand what they are. So, under the Sears criteria, patients need to have two or more of the following. A temperature greater than 38 degrees Celsius or less than 36 degrees Celsius, a heart rate greater than 90 beats per minute, a respiratory rate of greater than 20 breaths per minute or a PaCO2 less than 32, and a white blood cell count greater than 12,000 or less than 4,000 or greater than 10% immature bands. The SOFA score or sequential organ failure assessment is another method of identifying signs of sepsis. Scores range from 0 to 24 and are based on various measures of organ function organized by system, including lungs, cardiovascular, liver, central nervous system, coagulation, and renal. The higher the score, the higher the chance of mortality. We'll take a closer look at the exact SOFA criteria on the next slide. The downfall of using the SOFA score is that it requires laboratory tests, which make it difficult to complete a quick assessment of a patient. 
Thus, it is very rarely used in the emergency department and used mainly in ICU patients. Here is the specific criteria for the SOFA score. There are six different categories patients are scored on. These include PaO2 to FiO2 ratio, platelets, bilirubin, MAP, or vasopressor use, GCS score, creatinine, and urine output. For each category, patients receive a score from 0 to 4 based on the measured laboratory value. The higher the score, the more severe the organ failure is and the higher the chance of mortality. Looking at a measurement for renal function, you can use either creatinine or urine output. You do not use both in the calculation of the score. Because the SOFA score is not feasible for use in the emergency department setting, researchers developed the QSOFA or Quick SOFA score. This is used mainly for patients not in the ICU setting since it can be completed quickly and does not require the laboratory tests that the SOFA score requires. It assists healthcare workers in determining patients who have suspected or documented infection and are at an increased risk for a poor outcome. The criteria for the QSOFA are much simpler than the SOFA score. They include altered mental status, which is measured by a GCS of less than 15, low blood pressure with systolic blood pressure less than or equal to 100, and a high respiratory rate of 22 breaths per minute or faster. The QSOFA final score ranges from 0 to 3. Patients receive one point for every criteria they meet, and scores of 2 or higher are indicative of higher risk infections that lead to prolonged ICU care and or death. The graph on the right shows a distribution of how the QSOFA score in non-ICU patients correlates to risk of a bad outcome. As the QSOFA score increases, the risk of a bad outcome increases as well. This is a figure developed for sepsis 3 that can be used to help you determine if a patient has sepsis or septic shock based on the criteria we talked about. So if you have a patient that comes into the emergency room with a suspected infection, the first thing you want to do is look at their QSOFA score. As a reminder, those criteria are respiratory rate greater than 22, mental status or GCS score less than 15, and a systolic blood pressure less than 100. If they meet two or more of those criteria, the next thing you want to do is assess for evidence of organ dysfunction. You do that by using the SOFA score. And again, those variables are PaO2 to FiO2 ratio, um, GCS score, mean arterial pressure or vasopressor use, bilirubin, platelet count, and serum creatinine or urine output. If the patient meets two or more of those criteria, um, then they most likely have sepsis. And then to determine if they have septic shock, um, you look at their status after receiving fluid resuscitation. If they are requiring vasopressors to maintain a MAP of greater than or equal to 65, and they also have a serum lactate level of greater than 2, you can say that they have septic shock. In a patient with suspected sepsis or septic shock, providers should begin resuscitation and treatment right away for optimal outcomes. These are medical emergencies and have extremely poor outcomes when not treated properly and have a 25-50% to 50 mortality rate. In this presentation, we are focusing on initial resuscitation treatment that should be initiated in the emergency department setting. The recommendations come from the Surviving Sepsis Campaign International Guidelines for Management of Sepsis and Septic Shock um, from 2016. These treatments include antimicrobial therapy, fluids, vasopressors or inotropes, and steroids. We will go into more detail about each one of these in the upcoming slides. During the diagnosis process of sepsis, providers should always obtain cultures to determine the source of infection. Two blood cultures should be obtained for each patient regardless of suspected site of infection. In addition, cultures should be obtained from the suspected site of infection, which may include respiratory secretions, wounds, urine, cerebrospinal fluid, or other places. It is important that these cultures are obtained prior to starting antimicrobial therapy, as long as it does not delay the start of therapy. After obtaining cultures, IV antimicrobials should be started within one hour of suspected sepsis or septic shock.
Every additional hour providers wait to initiate the antimicrobials is related to an increase in mortality. When starting the therapy, providers should use broad-spectrum antimicrobials based on common pathogens at the infection site to cover for all potential pathogens. These include gram-positive, gram-negative bacteria, mixed bacteria, and occasionally fungi or viruses like we discussed earlier. Several factors should be taken into consideration when determining an optimal antimicrobial regimen for a patient including source or site of the suspected infection, history of resistant pathogens, previous antimicrobial use, immunosuppression, and the patient's previous medical history. For example, if a patient has a history of chronic kidney disease, the choice of antimicrobial or the dose and dosing interval will be affected. Common antibiotics utilized for empiric treatment include carbapenems, beta-lactamase inhibitors like piperacillin tazobactam, anisodomonal third-generation cephalosporins, fourth-generation cephalosporins, or vancomycin. These can be used as monotherapy or in combination with one another depending on the severity of the infection. When I talk about monotherapy in this sense, it does not mean that the patient is only receiving one antibiotic. Instead, it means that we are not double covering an organism. For example, you may have a septic patient started on piptazo and vancomycin. Piptazo covers pseudomonas, while vancomycin does not. Once the culture results are back, the therapy should be changed to target the specific pathogens identified in the culture. Treatment link is based on the site of infection, but usually lasts about 7 to 10 days for most sepsis or septic shock cases. However, patients who are not responding well to therapy may require a longer course of treatment. When treating someone for possible sepsis, one of the initial treatments involves fluid resuscitation. This is completed by giving the patient 30 milliliters per kilogram of IV crystalloid fluids within three hours of determining possible sepsis. Examples of crystalloid fluids include 0.9% sodium chloride, D5W, and lactated ringers. Fluid resuscitation is used in these septic patients due to the pathophysiology. Sepsis is a type of distributive shock, meaning that all of the blood vessels in the body are dilated and become leaky. Because of this, there is a lack of adequate blood flow throughout the body, leading to tissue hypoperfusion. This causes acute organ dysfunction, decreased blood pressure, and increased lactate, which may represent tissue hypoperfusion. Thus, administering fluids assists with repairing the hypovolemia and fixing the issues just mentioned with tissue hypoperfusion. After giving the patient this initial volume of fluid, additional fluids may be given as needed to achieve hemodynamic stability. Providers may think about giving albumin to patients if they have fluid refractory sepsis. These patients have received large amounts of crystalloid fluids but are still requiring more to increase intravascular blood volume. In addition to antimicrobials and fluid resuscitation, another important aspect involved in the initial resuscitation of septic patients is vasopressors or inotropes to improve blood pressure. In septic shock patients, the goal mean arterial pressure is greater than or equal to 65. To achieve this goal, the first line agent is norepinephrine. This is preferred over other agents because it has the most data for use in sepsis from previous trials. Other options for vasopressor therapies in specific cases include phenylephrine and dopamine. Phenylephrine is good for use in patients with tachyarrhythmia, while dopamine can be used in select bradycardic septic patients who are at low risk for arrhythmia. In some patients, norepinephrine may not be enough to increase blood pressure, so in these cases you can add vasopressin at a dose up to 0.03 units per minute to reach the goal map or simply to decrease the need for norepinephrine. This is used as a replacement of endogenous vasopressin. Epinephrine can also be added to norepinephrine like the vasopressin to reach the goal map. The last main treatment for initial resuscitation and sepsis is the use of steroids. These are utilized in patients who are hemodynamically unstable and continue to have low blood pressure even after treatment with fluids and vasopressors. The typical steroid utilized in septic shock is hydrocortisone 200 mg intravenously daily. The dose is typically split up into several equal doses throughout the day, 
An example dosing regimen is 50 milligrams every six hours. Here's a summary of the initial resuscitation steps that should be completed in all patients presenting with possible sepsis. First, determine if the patient meets sepsis criteria, including the Sears criteria and QSOFA. Second, attempt to determine the site of infection and obtain cultures. Third, start broad-spectrum antibiotics within one hour. Fourth, give 30 milliliters per kilogram of fluid resuscitation within three hours. Five, initiate vasopressor therapy if needed to obtain a map of greater than or equal to 65, um, with the first line agent being norepinephrine and um, adding vasopressin or epinephrine if needed. Six, begin steroid treatment, usually hydrocortisone, if the patient is still hemodynamically unstable after fluids and vasopressor therapy. And lastly, start albumin for fluid refractory sepsis if needed. Here is a list of the references I used to put together this presentation. I hope you enjoyed this video on sepsis and found it educational. It is an important topic to understand as many patients present to the emergency department with sepsis-like symptoms.